So he's talking about disks and drives. This is a big issue. Um, the same again in all versions of Windows, but you certainly need to know how to manage your disks. Um, there's computer management is where you find disk management. That's where you do almost everything you want to do in the command line environment. You can also do it all or in, in the GUI. You also do it all in the command line with, with disk part. Um, so um, since Vista, you can now shrink partitions as well as expand them, which is really nice. So if you want to shrink your disk in half and put on some other operating system, like a Windows Server or Ubuntu Linux or something, you can do it with building tools. You used to have to go buy Partition Magic or a Chronos Partition Expert or something like that. Um, and you still get more features if you do that. But you get um, some ability to shrink partitions. It is, by the way, fantastically bad at doing it. If you buy a new computer with 500 gigs, it's got nothing on there but Windows and Office. It's maybe 10 gigs of stuff. You'll try to shrink it, and it will only go down to like 300 gigs and stop. It's weird. And um, uh, there's some tricks, but it's just it's very strange and stubborn. It's not, if you get Partition Expert or Partition, Man um, or Partition Magic, you can totally shrink it down as much as you ought to. The Windows tool is very odd. But it is better than nothing, and you can't argue with the price. You also have um, dynamic disk for removable drives, which is bizarre, and I don't understand why anybody would ever do it. Dynamic disk itself is kind of a boondoggle. Microsoft brought it out with Windows 2000 Server, and it's a way to combine disk volumes into complicated arrays. Like if your boss is using a computer and a hard drive is full, you can add another whole hard drive and add it to C. So C is bigger. C is now the combination of two drives, um, which is kind of cool, but in fact it has a lot of weird bugs. And one of the main things about it is every time you move a dynamic disk from one computer to another, it's completely fouled up and you have to import it. So putting in removable drives is a very strange thing to do. But anyway, it now supports that. Um, and you can use the disk format, which I don't see people using much, but she needs. Anyway, you can start disk management any way you like. And once you're in there, um, you can check any of your volumes and partitions and create and delete them, assign drive letters, and you can create mounted drives, which are hard drives mounted like folders, not with drive letters, which is important in case you have really big systems and you have more than 26 drives. You're not limited by the number of letters. <laughs> um, so you, now there are two kinds of disks, basic and dynamic disk. For all practical purposes, you only want to use basic disk. Dynamic disk makes it possible to create some strange structures that people almost never use, like software arrays. Software arrays are kind of ridiculous. You can have um, multiple copies of the data, but these bugs down the operating system every time it reads and writes. It's not any faster than a single drive. And you cannot do hot swap. If one of the drives fails, you have to turn off the machine to replace the drive. So all of this means almost nobody uses a software array. They all buy a hardware array device, which takes care of it all in the control. Your computer thinks it's used just one drive. It's making multiple copies of it. It has a light that turns red. You pull out that drive, swap in another. That's what everybody does. But Microsoft does have the ability to create drive arrays in software with dynamic disk. It's just I don't know anybody that uses it. Anyway, you can do all this stuff from disk part. Disk part is quite useful. You can use disk part to forensically clean a drive. You can cover it with zeros. You don't need to get there. Boot and boot. You can erase the drive with disk part, and it's clean, gone forever. You can donate the computer to a college or something after that. There's also FSUtil, which I've never used, but it lets you do very esoteric things, like um, discover if your drive is clean or dirty. There's a dirty bit on your drive. If the drive is known to have an error, it's dirty. And the next time you boot, it will run check disk. And you control the dirty bit with FSUtil and other extremely esoteric things like reparse points and such. Hard drives are fantastically complicated. And if you, there's a whole subculture at DEF CON if you want to get into it, and that's what they're going to talk about some of the drive savers. If you really find out what's going on in hard drives and you really want to fix them, it's a gigantic complex specialty. And we'll cover some of it in the forensics course next semester. But uh, if you go to DEF CON, there's a whole group of talks by the people that are really, really into this stuff. There's a special part of the area of the hard drive you can never access, used for the drive firmware, and you can hide data there, and you can hide malware there, and you can take off the drive firmware and put in altered drive firmware to get special properties. It's pretty awesome. Um, hard drives are quite complicated, but controlling them for normal purposes in Windows is easy. Um, all right, so you, the command prompt, of course, is important for everything. Microsoft made a real commitment ever since XP to make sure everything can be done from the command prompt, and now that they have a PowerShell, there's often a lot of things you can do from the command prompt that you cannot do from the GUI, which is the way it ought to be. That's the way Unix is. And usually, command prompt is the most powerful way to control any machine. And it's important because you want to be able to script everything. 
You do it on one machine and you want to have some kind of script and do it to all 1,000 of your machines at your enterprise. You want it all to be done with a script. And so you can do that. Um, also, if you use server core, server core has no GUI. Everything has to be done at the command line. You know, Microsoft has for 10 or 15 years now understood that real server administrators want everything to be done in text only mode for the same reason Unix is done that way because that is the best way to really control the machine if you're serious. The mouse is basically just a crutch and uh, they understand that. So everything's available in the command line if you want. So here's basic concepts. A volume is a disk or part of a disk that has a drive layer. That's a now ready for use. A mounted drive is a disk or part of a disk that is assigned like a folder somewhere you can have C, desktop, and then instead of documents, you can have a drive there. It'll look a little different, but it can be referred to the same way. So we, before you can use a disk, you have to format it. Now, formatting means you put reference marks on the disk so that the um, file system is available. And you have to choose the file system at this point. Almost everybody's using NTFS, the one Microsoft brought out in 1993. There are different versions of NTFS, but they're all so similar, you don't even notice when you're on a different version. And, um, NTFS has all the features for modern computers. Like I mentioned before, Microsoft was going to create the replacement for NTFS, WinFS. They worked on it for a long time and finally just abandoned it. And the next drive format after this is um, ReFS, Resilient File System, which is intended for large arrays. And Microsoft has said that RAIDs are now obsolete, which is probably correct. Because drives have gotten so big, if you've got a defect on one drive in a RAID, you throw away the whole drive and put in another one, and that's kind of stupid because drives are so big they have little defects all the time. So a resilient file system puts little stripes of data on the drive, and if one goes bad, it marks it bad, just uses another one. So it is resilient, and then a drive can fail and you don't lose data, but it doesn't have the wasteful and slow process of throwing away a whole drive every time you have an error, which is what RAIDs do. Anyway, uh, that's mainly intended for servers. So for all practical purposes, we're all using NTFS, there was an older system called FAT, used by Windows 95 and Windows 98, still used on floppy disks and on thumb drives often. Um, but compact disks usually use CDFS or perhaps UD, UFA, UDF. But NTFS is the main one. Now the other one, which is a little hard to grasp, is the difference between a basic disk and a dynamic disk. Um, a basic disk uses a partition structure that is extremely old. I think it comes from the 70s. Um, and it is very, very simple. There is a partition table on the disk and the partition table has only a small amount of room. I'm just trying to find a good place to stash this thing. All right. Um, so the partition table only has enough room to store information about four partitions, and it cannot be expanded. It's four records, each 16 bytes long. And all you have room for is a starting cluster number, a number of clusters, and a few bytes, and a couple other facts. So you can have a total of four partitions. That's it. But you can uh, define one of them to be an extended partition which means there's going to be a second partition table here which can split it up further. So in fact, you can have as many pieces of this drive as you want to. Now, you might wonder why you want all these pieces of your drive. The original reason was because in FAT, you get FAT16 can only go up to a two gigabyte volume. And so when drives came out that were bigger than that, you had to cut them up into C, D, and E, and F for your Windows 98 system because um, you couldn't have more than two gigs at a time. That's all over with NTFS and, for that matter, FAT32, but it's still convenient to cut them up, for example, if you have multi-boots, so an XP on one and Windows 7 on another. It's best to put them on a different partition. And it's also a very good idea to put your user data on one partition separate from the operating system because it makes it easy to back them up and, and such. So um, it may not be that most, of course, 90% of home users just have one volume called C that's every operating system, all the documents, use the whole drive make one partition, and that's the default install the most common one. Anyway. Um, so how many can yeah. you have on that four? You've got this four. one had four. Yeah, That's this it. one had four. <clears throat> yeah, one of my machines I had when I first put on Vista. Um, and so dynamic disks lets you have more complicated structures. You can have a simple volume, which is just the same as a partition for all practical purposes. The, the fundamental difference, by the way, between dynamic, basic disk and dynamic disk is that basic disk has a partition table at the start of the disk, which I described, it's four times 16 bytes. Dynamic disk still has a partition table, but it's not used. It's just a useless appendix. It takes a one megabyte part at the end of the drive. And by the way, if your drive is completely allocated, you cannot convert it to dynamic. You have to have one megabyte free at the end. So a common Microsoft recommendation is when you are signing partitions, always leave one megabyte free at the end. So you can convert it to dynamic if you want to. 
The current dynamic disk contains a one megabyte database which stores all the information about these partitions. And therefore, it is essentially unlimited. You can have as many partitions as you want. It's no way limited just for. And, and then if you have multiple physical drives, that one megabyte partition is synchronized so each one of them contains all the information about all the drives in a dynamic disk array. And that's why if you bring in a disk from outside, like a USB drive, it will be foreign and it will have to be imported, which replaces that one megabyte, which updates the one megabyte database to match all the others before you can use it in a dynamic array. And this is all intended to make things like RAIDs. Um, Windows 7 no longer supports all five dynamic disk types, but only these three. A uh, simple volume is just a bunch of continuous blocks on one drive. It's the same thing as what you call a partition, just a, a region of a drive. You can have a spanned volume, which will confine space from non-contiguous blocks of a disk or from one disk and a separate physical disk. This, this is probably the main reason anybody would use it. Uh, because, for example, uh, I have this installed here on a 34 gig partition. Well, I might very well find, and you will find, uh, Microsoft operating system since Vista swell by one gigabyte per month on average. Because the updates are never removed, they keep up setting back up, they go in the WinSSX folder, which you cannot clean off. So you can install this and it will seem fine, but within about a year it will be full. And then you'll wish it was on something bigger. Now what you ought to do is make an image backup, Repartition your drive or put in another drive and restore. That's the right way to put it in a bigger volume. But if for some reason you don't want to do that and you want to add to this, you could go to dynamic disk and then take some gigs over here and add them in. So I take this 34 and add another 30 over here and call it all F. And F is now bigger. See, that's that's what a spanned volume is. Yeah. 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 Why are uh, the first three purple and not blue? Because the first three are um, uh, simple partitions and the last one's an extended partition. Now, the standard partition always has that green box, and you can have further subdivisions inside it. That's good. All right. Um, so a strike volume, you can also make these. Strike volumes are, again, something, it would be very strange to do it this way. Now, a strike volume is a useful thing. The, rec the official Microsoft recommendation for servers is your operating system should be on a mirrored volume, and your page file should be on a strike volume. A mirrored volume on two physical drives and keep two copies of all the data. So if one fails, you have another copy all ready to go. That's appropriate for a system volume. A striped drive will have some drives, and to make it work, you ought to have three or more. Uh, if you really have some number of physical drives and you have as many controllers as you have drives, then a stripe will write, I think it's 64 kilobytes, a small stripe of data here, and next stripe of data here, next stripe of data here, next stripe here, here, and here, 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 and here. And the reason it does it that way is because it's faster. All three drives are now spinning, they're all writing at once, they're all reading at once. It reads and writes faster. It is more prone to failure. There is no extra copies. If any one of these drives fails, the files are all unreadable. Um, you've clearly lost holes out of the middle of all the files, they won't open anymore. So this increases the chance of you losing data, but it makes it faster. So it's appropriate for the page file. Remember, the page file is data that was supposed to be in RAM. RAM is extremely fragile. If the power fails for an instant, you lose it all. So evidently, you were willing to accept a high risk of failure for the sake of speed. So this array, this striped array, is the natural thing for the page file. Anyway, but if you did it with dynamic disks in software, you wouldn't get any of these benefits because the processor can only be writing to one at a time. So I really don't know why they even have software stripe arrays. And what you want is a hardware stripe. Anyway, um, but that's the game. So that's what a dynamic disk is for. Um, all right, there are some other kinds of disks, and these are becoming popular, the GPT disks. Um, see, the master boot record is the record at this 512 byte in the first sector of every disk that's used to start the machine, and it is, has the partition table, and it is really, really old, like I think more than 30 years old, and has a lot of limitations that really aren't appropriate anymore. So you can ignore it completely, and this is what Macs do. You, know, you have your G GUID partition table. This is the replacement one. And we have some machines set up in the lab with GPT on them to try it out, and if you buy a modern, um, laptop, like with Windows 8 on, it's typically GPT. I was surprised. I've got a new machine. It had like five partitions on it right from the start. You can only have four basic. It's a GPT disk. So these things are out there. Um, <coughs> and of course, it's the more modern um, system. You can have 128 partitions. You can have 18 million terabytes in each partition. You know, it's the next system, much bigger and nicer. Um, it only comes on 64-bit Windows and Telemax use it. Um, it's the wave of the future, finally updating this very old basic disk system. But a lot of machines are still using the basic disk, probably the majority of them. Um, all right, now there's another very 
common focus of confusion, which is the active partition. Um, the active partition means, do I have a picture of a multi-drive array here? I don't have it up. All right. Wait, the active partition works like this. Um, it only makes any difference if you have multiple physical hard drives. So suppose I have three hard drives, disk zero, one, and two, and then I'll, maybe I'll make this C and this D and this E and this F and this G and this whole thing is H. You can do that and they can be any size you want. Okay, now the point is when you first turn on the power, the BIOS will hunt for your hard drive and then it will hunt for an operating system and it will do that by running the master boot record. Every single drive has an MBR at the start. The first 512 byte sector on every drive is the master boot record. So your computer now has a problem. It doesn't know which one of these master boot records to use. So what you do is you mark one partition, the active partition. And all that, and it could just as well be D, it would be exactly the same. All the active partition does is tell it which physical drive to boot from. And therefore it will ignore these master boot records completely. And as soon as the power on self-test is over and it's decided the hard drives are working, it will run the code found here, which will boot up the operating system. That's that's what the active partition is. Um, if you don't mark a partition active, it can't be used to start your machine. So you could, for, by the way, even though you use this master boot record, that does not mean that this is the operating system. It will present you with an operating system menu. The master boot record will then ask you which one you want to boot up, and you might boot up down here. This could very well be the system volume down here, but the master boot record here is what's used to start it. Okay? That's what the active partition is. Anyway. Of course, for home users, they only have one drive, they only have one partition, it's of course active C. Um, so there are three partitions. The active partition I just described, the system and boot partitions are the others, and they're used in that order. So first the active partition is used just to start the machine with the master boot record. Then the system partition is what contains the boot menu, which asks you which operating system you want to run, and the boot partition is the one that actually contains the operating system. So it's easy to remember because it's backwards. The system file contains system partition contains the boot files, and the boot files contain C Windows system. Everything is usually backwards in the world of Microsoft, and it's not entirely their fault because they inherited this stuff from really, really old standards from IBM. Anyway, um, so that's the process when your machine starts. I got a few eye clickers about that. Yes, there we are. Okay, so what type of disk is limited to four primary partitions? That's strike volumes. That's what they're for. Although I greatly doubt that the Microsoft software strike will actually have that effect, but maybe it will in a certain condition. I'm not sure. All right. So if I want to store data on a volume without a drive letter, what feature lets me do that? C32 
Windows System 32. will combine two physical disks into a single volume. If I just want a bigger F, I'm going to add another whole hard drive and add F. doing this project where they make another partition, and sometimes they would make a mistake and make a fifth partition, and it would automatically convert to dynamic, and then none of the operating systems on that drive would boot anymore, and there's no way to fix it. It's very annoying. I hope they finally fixed it, but that's why the whole dynamic disk thing seems to me like one of these Microsoft things that never really quite made it out of beta, and they didn't even make it consistent with their own bootloader. So it seems like, I don't know what they thought it was good for, but it never really became popular. Anyway, um, all right. So you've got a new hard disk. Um, if you're going to install Windows on a disk, you can, when you're first installing, you can say, just put it in the unallocated space, and it will automatically format it and partition it. Now, it might use, it will use all free space, and it will no longer just make one partition. Of course, it will make that 100 megabyte partition in front, and then use all the rest for C. That 100 megabyte partition in front contains the bootloader, um, and it contains the information if you later decide to encrypt it with BitLock. Contains the the stub system that starts it out. So if you want to make a new simple volume, you can do that in drive management. If you have extra space and a basic disk, if you just have extra space you're not using, you can make a new simple volume in that space. And then you can just use the size, drive letter, and format to make another volume. Um, you, here's simple volumes. Simple volumes are just blocks of contiguous space. So from this um, sector on the disk going to that sector is C, this part is D, that whole disk is E, that's perfectly fine and you can make a simple volume on a basic disk or a dynamic disk. Um, if you want to format it, you can do that here. Just right click and format it. Choose your uh, file system and allocation size. The file system you almost always want in TFS, although you can make fat partitions if you want to. It's just they're out of date and not very useful. And you can choose the allocation unit size, which is the smallest possible amount of disk that can be given a name. So if you store a notepad file with only a few hundred letters in it, it will still use 4,096 bytes on the file because that's the smallest amount of disk space that can be allocated. Um, if you can make that bigger, then your disk will, you find files faster because the, uh, it'll be more coarsely grained, but it will waste more space. So usually the default is fine, but you can adjust the allocation unit size if you want to. Um, all right. So there's a very, very common misconception. Well, I remember when I first started teaching here, the, the teacher, we had this, everyone turned their homework on floppy disks. The other teacher said, well, I have floppy disks. I just reformat them, and then I give them to students the next semester. So I give it, a disk, students a floppy disk that has been used by a previous student with complete safety. And that is not true at all. Formatting does absolutely nothing. All formatting does is mark the receptors available. It doesn't remove any of the data until you write your data on top of it. It's a very common misconception of formatting drive erases data, which is fed by the Microsoft box that will pop up saying, this data will be gone and you can't retrieve it. Well, that means that there's nothing in Windows that will bring it back, but it's still there. Um, so if you really want to erase data, you can use format slice P according to your book, although in my test I was unable to successfully erase drives with it, or cipher W. This is what the iPhone does. The iPhone, after 4S, iPhones are encrypted all the time before you ever turn them on, 
and when you say reset the factory defaults, it erases the key. This is a fantastically good system, and it works in practice. There was a test where forensic scientists bought 100 used iPhones on eBay, and they tried to recover data from them. They were unable to recover anything. That is the way to do it. And you can do that, for example, if with, um, that's supposed to be Windows 8.1 default. I've tested it. Supposedly, Windows 8.1 will not have BitLocker on by default. So your disk will just be encrypted all the time. And then when you erase the key, you've really protected your data. This is a very good idea. But and you can do it with Cypher. You can use Cypher will do NTFS encryption for a partition. And then you can delete the key. Um, that's one other way to go. Um, all right. I personally like to use disk part and then clean all. That covers the whole disk with zeros. That's another forensically sound erasure technique. Anyway, um, all right, you normally want NTFS. FAT and FAT32 are pretty much out of date. If you have a multi-boot with Windows 98, who in the world would do that? But anyway, if you did, you might want a fat for that reason. <laughs> a removable device is often used fat. This has turned out to be a problem for a lot of my students. They look at a big flash thumb drive, like 8 gigs or 16 gigs. They format it NTFS. Now you've got a problem because NTFS has permissions. So when you move it to another machine, it's owned by the administrator on the previous machine, and it won't let you have full control of the files. It's very annoying. What you have to do is you have to go to the root of the drive and make it own, change order to everyone and give everyone full control to reproduce what you expect, which is you can put it in any machine and fully use it. Otherwise, you will find yourself locked out of the files. And if you move to a machine where you're not the local administrator, you won't have the authority to take ownership and fix it. So I have students save their stuff at home, bring it in on a USB, and they can't use it. <laughs> it's kind of annoying. Anyway, um, that's what we good about that. Because there are no permissions to worry about. But it doesn't let you have big enough files or folders for modern things like you can't take virtual machines in. Anyway, uh, by the way, there's various options for optical media. UDF version 1.5 is the most compatible. There are later versions, um, which I don't see much of. They give you more features, but then they can't be read by older versions, so I'm not sure why you'd bother with them. Um, so NTFS is much better than FAT. That's why nobody would install Windows 7 on FAT. In fact, I don't even think you could because you couldn't make a partition big enough to hold it. Anyway, um, but the main, either huge, huge partitions are the main reason people use it, so you can have large volumes. It also has permissions and encrypting file systems, so you can have full control for administrators and read only for users and all that jazz. You don't have any of that with FAT. FAT, the only permissions you have are like a read only flag, which can easily be reversed. Physical access to the drive implies full control over it. It's appropriate for something like a floppy. All I want, if you have it, you have full control over it. Um, NTFS is a journaling file system, so it doesn't constantly have to run check disk. Every time there's a small error, it can remember what it was doing and pick where, where it left off. Um, you can expand volumes. It's much more efficient than FAT for large partitions. FAT was a very old-fashioned system like the master boot record that just had records of a fixed size. You could only have so many records, and you have to hunt through the table to find files. NTFS has a database with variable size records. It's much more efficient at addressing space on the disk for large disks, which is pretty much everything these days. And who's got an eight gigabyte disk anymore? Um, and by the way, remember when I said that example, I said you have a four kilobyte cluster, and that means if you store a small text file, you waste four kilobytes. But it's not true that if you store a file that's only one byte long, one letter, you waste four kilobytes. It stores it in the database, in the NTFS master file table. It doesn't use any clusters at all. It stores it with the file name up to about 100 or 200 bytes to avoid wasting so much space on small files. Because there are a lot of things that make a lot of small files, like some logs or a bunch of small files. And so if you do make small files, NTFS does not waste as much space the way FAT would. FAT, if you store it in Notepad and type one letter and save it, FAT would really use four kilobytes to store that file. NTFS would not. Anyway, um, all right. So if you want to extend a volume, just go into Disk Management, right click, and extend volume. If there's unused space to the right of the partition, you can extend into that. Um, of course, you usually would not design a drive that way, but you could. Um, you can only extend NTFS drives. You can only, uh, if you're in an extended partition, you can't go across that boundary to another partition. You can only extend system and boot partition into contiguous unallocated space. You can't extend a strike volume. There's quite a few limitations. Um, you can shrink a volume. Right click and shrink. It will shrink down to whatever part of that drive the Windows thinks it's using. Um, and as I mentioned, it is very strange. You buy a brand new machine with a 500 gig drive and try to shrink it, you only be able to shrink it by like one or 200 gigs for no apparent reason. So there are a lot of steps if you want to try to uh, get it to really shrink. Turning off system restore might do it because 
See, the problem is, you have a drive, it's 500 gigs. Windows is really only using a tiny piece of it. I want to shrink it, but it'll only shrink down to here. So what that means is Microsoft Windows is using something there. Something has been put there, the page file or something blocking it. So you're trying to get it to shove everything down here to make more room to shrink. So if you turn off System Restore, that might work because there might be restore points through here. If you get rid of the page file, that might work because that might be the page file that was there. If you defrag, it might help, but it might not. Microsoft defrags often don't do much. So a third-party defragmenter is likely to help. And the most drastic solution, of course, is just make an image backup of the operating system, then wipe the drive clean, make it however you want, then put the image back. That's a simple answer. That's what Ed Bott recommends. If you're bound and determined to do this without paying for a third-party fragmentation, uh, disband your tool like a Chronos Partition Expert. That's one way to do it. Anyway, uh, you use a convert command, which, is, which converts from FAT to NTFS. Um, it is a one-way conversion, and if you want to be picky, the NTFS you end up with is not exactly the same as a clean NTFS. It has some leftover FAT stuff as a useless appendix. Um, but in practice, it works. This was there for people to upgrade from Windows 98 to Windows 2000. I don't know why you do it these days, but you can convert to NTFS. By the way, I, um, I found this helpful. I did a research project about a year ago on a forensic tool called, um, I forget the name of it, there's in case, there's a free forensic tool, which, um, and it fails on drives that have been converted this way. It was very interesting, it gives you the wrong answers, which is really pretty bad because there's people in prison based on the result of those forensic tools. It's not good when they're giving you the wrong answer. Anyway, um, but I think he passed it after I told him about that. So you can change volume labels. You can just right click and rename your drive to put this alphabetical label on it any way you like. Um, you can change drive letters right here. Change drive letters. One very, very annoying thing, I think I've told you before, but it's worth mentioning again, is that drive letters are not attached to the drive at all. Drive letters depend on how you install the operating system. So if you have this machine, C, D, E, F, G, and H, and I decide to install something on H. I'm going to wipe it clean and install something on H. If I start an operating system here, like Windows Vista, then I put in the Windows 7 DVD and run it from the running operating system and install it down here. It will install it on H, and when I boot here, it will call it H. But if I put in the if turn off the machine, put in the CD and boot from the CD and install Windows 7 here, then when I and say I had Vista here and Windows 7 down there, then when I boot to Vista. This drive will be called H, and that will be called C. When I boot to Windows 7, this drive will be called C. The letters are assigned during boot up. They are not really written on the drive anywhere. You can't trust the letters. It's very rude. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, that's the game there. Uh, you can change drive letters, but you can't do it for the boot volume, the system volume, or a volume with a page file. You can map a volume to a folder, which we talked about. Um, so one thing you could do is you could add another drive and put it in C programs. Then copy over the contents of C programs and suddenly they'd have more room on their C drive. Um, that's one possible way to do it. You can mount it in a folder. You can install Windows, not just from a CD, but of course from a USB or a flash disk. Um, that's what you have to do these days with modern devices, netbooks that don't have any optical drive. Um, it's pretty nice too because then you can modify the contents. You can, for example, take away its information about which version you're installing and install a different version. In this lab, we did that with VMware, where you want to install Ultimate from your uh, non-Ultimate DVD. If you put it on a USB drive, you can just tell it to be Ultimate. Install any version you want. Of course, after 30 days, it'll start whining about not having a product key, but um, it'll work. So you, want to, you can go right-click on a drive and go to Properties, and this will tell you what file format it is, um, how full it is, and so on. It's pretty nice. Computer management shows you the status up here. So here I've got raw BitLocker encrypted. Here I've got an NTFS volume. Um, it shows all of them down here. Gives you general information about your disks up there, how big they are, and so on. Um, so the disk status, online is good. Offline is what a dynamic disk will say if it has errors. Offline is a dynamic disk that's unavailable. And foreign is like, say, a dynamic disk that was initialized on a different machine. And now when it's brought in, it observes that the information in the one megabyte dynamic disk database does not agree with the disks I'm looking at, and it has to go through the import process to synchronize. That's why moving dynamic disks around is very strange. I don't know why they expect you to do that. Unreadable is obviously a damaged drive. Missing 
is a drive that is expected to be there because you have a dynamic array and the working dynamic drives have that one meg write and they say, wait, there ought to be a third drive here. Why is it not there? And marks it missing. I have information about a third drive, but somehow it's not there. Uh, not initialized is what you'll get if it's brand new or if it's not recognized because Linux uses a bunch of other file systems that Microsoft does not support like ext3 and ext4. So if you do dual boot with Linux, you got to watch it. I gave up dual booting with Linux years ago because I had so many problems. Every time you'd upgrade one OS, it would kill the other. You really have to be an expert at messing with Grub, fixing all the boot error problems. What I find to be much more practical is to choose one to use and you put the rest in virtual machines. Put your Windows in VMs or put your Linux in VMs so they never see each other. It's a lot more practical than actually maintaining a dual boot. You can make a dual boot, but when you try going to the next version of either Linux or Windows, it will keep wiping one or the other out. Um, all right. Healthy is good. Healthy at risk means it found errors on a dynamic disk. Healthy unknown partition is another one of these warnings that um, Microsoft doesn't know what's going on on that partition. If it was BitLocker, it would know that. But if it's something else, like Linux has about 50 disk formats, like ZFS, all sorts of exotic ones, and Microsoft doesn't support any of them, they'll just say, I don't know what this nonsense is. Why isn't it NTFS or FAT? Um, all right. Here's initializing and failed and unknown. Our, our course. Uh, this is what happens when you're in, bringing in a dynamic disk and synchronizing the, the database. This is when it fails. And unknown is one of the things you'll see with a corrupted boot center. Um, all right. And one big thing Microsoft is very proud of is virtual hard disks. And this is an area where Microsoft is a leader in virtualization. Um, they, they push this a lot. I'm not sure why people do this. But you can create a virtual hard disk right in disk management. It's going to be a file on a hard drive living in one of these other partitions. And it'll appear as a virtual hard disk. And then you can even boot from it. So you can have a virtual machine running in Hyper-V or in Microsoft um, Virtual PC, and then you can boot into that virtual machine. So the line between a virtual machine and a real machine is blurred. I, I don't know why. I haven't heard any use case, but Microsoft worked hard to make this happen, so they must have some plan. This makes sense. Um, so you can create them, you can use them. In, in VMware, that is emphatically not the case. You have these virtual hard disks, and the only way to really get at the files on them is to boot up VMware and connect to them. And so, you know, it's kind of a drag. For example, students will be doing homework, take pictures in the virtual machine, and then they want to send in their homework from the real machine, and it's not easy to do that. You can't go in the VM. In Microsoft World, you could totally open the virtual hard disk and take the files out of there and put them on a real hard disk, um, which is kind of nice. They're ahead of VMware in that regard. All right. Um, so, what you use is an advantage that FAT has. That doesn't have a lot of advantages, but it does have some. That, by the way, is the entry file allocation table. NTFS is a new technology file system. It's compatible with really old stuff. That's the only thing good about it. All right. Um, all right. Uh, which one of these? What you put 128 partitions on a basic disk? That's GPT, which, by the way, the NTFS will not do it. GPT does it. This is a good partition table, which, by the way, is the kind of thing English experts typically hate computer people because they just make up words and they do horrible things you should never do. And this is one of those things you should never do. GUID is an acronym. G-U-I-D stands for Globally Unique Identifier. The GUID partition table is an acronym of an acronym. The G here stands for GUID, which is double indirect addressing, which is not legal in English, but common in computers. The only thing worse is Linux. Linux, GNU Linux is, Linux is secretly GNU Linux, and GNU stands for GNU, not Unix. So the G doesn't stand for anything. The G stands for the G. These are both forbidden in the laws of English. And computer people do it all the time, and English people get mad. Yeah. Um, 
show such as like. All right, uh, which of these can you not do with Windows 7? data, which you can get Recuva, is a free download that will do it. There's a bunch of others. <coughs> Used to be something called Norton Undelete, but I think it's not free. Recuva is free. And on the Mac, it's just drill, but it's free. These will both get your stuff back. All right. Um, so, that's for next time. Let's see you got the most right. And I'll go up to the lab if anybody wants help on projects.